Hello, magandang umaga po. Maraming salamat sa pagdalo sa ating um, special na panayam sa araw na to. Welcome everyone. This is still part of the Department of Broadcast Communications commemoration of the 70th anniversary of television in the, in the Philippines. And today we have a very special lecture from, our, um, from one of our lecturers in the department. And um, what makes this lecture important, significant, interesting, and exciting is um, it speaks about uh, the current media practice that uh, we are familiar with and the current media practice that has been defining the media landscape that we are, uh, that we belong to um, currently. Um, I wish everyone in the audience here today and those listening via the DZUP Facebook and YouTube um, channels a very good day. And I hope that you find this session enlightening interesting. Um, post your questions and comments later. We will have an open forum. But for now, I am very excited to um, introduce to you um, one of the um, you know, most um, special and um, one of the most diligent and amazing lecturers of the department. Sinasabi ito kasi kaibigan ko siya talaga. Yun lang naman yung dahil kung bakit ko siya sinasabi. Okay? But ano pa to Dumayo pa to from so many ano, points in the Philippines, from Batanes, and then from Kainta. Of course, Kainta is farther than Batanes. Uh, if you think about the traffic okay? <laughs> in, in, in the metro. So, uh, without further ado, I am introducing Dorian Marina. Uh, who will be talking about um, TikTok and the possibility of countering the algorithm in a world where we are so enamored by the short form. Dorian, maraming salamat po, and I'm please um, enjoy Dorian's talk. Okay, Kapian Kamo Pano Dios, si Chamo Bukas, Magadang Umaga sa inyong lahat. Ako po si Dorian Marina. Um, greetings. Uh, let me just take a moment to see if I can uh, get the audio as we like it for everybody who's uh, listening. Is that okay? Does that sound okay? Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, thank you very much for, um, for attending, for being here, those of you who are here in person. Um, a thank you to uh, those of you who are joining us online. Uh, welcome to our uh, discussion and talk. I hope this is useful and interesting um, for, for all of you. Um, maraming salamat sa Departamento, siyempre po, sa um, uh, Dr. Um, Alwin Aguirre. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Dean Paragas, and of course, uh, all the staff, uh, faculty, um, and students in the department, the uh, university community, and uh, everyone who is, who is tuning in. It is always an honor to be a part of events at UP um, and participate in the continued learning that we're all a part of and the sharing of information. Um, so it is a, a pleasure, pleasure to be here. Um, today I'll be talking about uh, different forms, different formats in media, and I will be approaching this primarily as a practitioner, as a media practitioner myself. Um, I am primarily interested in the uh, practical considerations we have about how we create media, the decisions we make uh, when producing media, um, how we envision our audience, and how we cultivate a relationship with our audience, um, and what the effects of our actions are. Uh, I myself have been a field reporter, um, I've been a, um, a producer in studio and, uh, and also in the field, um, as well as an editor. So I've had different roles in, um, in newsrooms, in media production, and I approach this with, with that experience and, and with 
um, a lot of questions that have come up in my own work over the years in terms of um, with the changing technology and media landscape, how do we approach the fundamental questions of how do we serve our audience, how do we serve the public, how do we get out information, how, we t how do we tell a story that is meaningful, compelling, and that will um, further a conversation that we're interested in. So we have a lot of questions to go over. Um, I'll bring up some examples, and uh, hopefully I'm posing some questions that we can all consider and talk about, and I look forward to discussing them with you at the conclusion of um, a presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, pero mauna, kain na tayo, kain mo na tayo, kumanta na, as we say in Batanes. We're going to co cover a lot of information here. Um, so we need some sustancia, right? So let's see. If we wanted to get some uh, food for our uh, souls and our spirits to go through this talk, um, I'm presenting two options, okay? Uh, we have a delicious plate of pancit with some... Uh, uh, drizzled calamansi and some pork maybe or hipon. Then on the other side, um, you know, kind of in recognition of my roots in LA and California, I put some tacos in there, maybe carne asada tacos. Uh, got some cilantro in there, some onions. Okay, so if we're considering getting some sustancia for us, um, and I'm sorry to disappoint, but this is more of like a thought exercise, so <laughs> we won't have people bringing food in, at least not yet, but hopefully this will be useful for us. Um, first, we need to decide what kind of food, right? Okay, so if we were going to bring in some, how many people want to, to go for the pancit, platter of pancit? Okay, we got some support. Okay, very nice. Okay, how many people want to go for the tacos? Ooh, it's about even. It's, it's a little difficult. Okay, okay. Um, have you found a good place for Mexican food in Manila? I'm still searching, but home, okay. Well, okay, if you want to <laughs> cook at home, someone says home, sure. Um, if we're going to make this decision, and I asked you for your input, first, we have to decide how we are going to consider the important factors, diba? Right? So, I asked you, so I maybe took the path for human interaction, right? over there, but of course, if we're interested in making a decision like this in our everyday lives, how many people reach up to your smartphone, right? Okay, I type in, I use an app, I engage with um, an AI tool possibly, right? Which um, immediately plugs me into an algorithm, right? And I start uh, inputting data, I start receiving data, okay? And I'm, I'm sent on this path of a decision-making process, okay? Similar to how I would do with a human interaction, but the differences are what we're interested in today, what we're going to look at. Now, you can see the important factors in making a decision like this. We have, you know, the type of food, uh, other users' opinion possibly, uh, the location, the price, okay? This phenomenon that is taking place as we develop this decision um, is an exchange or a transfer of information, and it's a decision making. But if we step back for a moment and we look at really what issues are at stake besides, you know, uh, getting some food, some sustenance, uh, sharing it with friends or family or so forth, larger issues are at stake here, right? There's issues of transparency when you make decisions. There's issues of the balance of power, okay? Competing interests, possibly. There's in these issues of privacy. Um, and if we do engage in the AI tool, we are creating also a digital memory, okay? There's a tracking that takes place, there's tracing that takes place, so there's a digital memory that we are participating in, which will be used in a many, many different ways moving forward. Perhaps it will be used with machine learning, it will be used to create more sophisticated algorithms in the future, but we are participating in that. As you can see, my point here is just to illustrate that something as simple as choosing a food item or, or what we want to eat can include a multiple um, uh, layer process of decision making that we need to engage in. Now, as you saw, what I did is I asked for your 
input, right? I could also say, well, you know, um, I think the way we're going to make this decision is uh, when you walked in, we did use some facial recogni recognizing uh, software. Maybe you didn't notice it. But we were able to access your posts and your preferences. And I don't need to ask you because I already know what your preference is going to be, right? I already know you kind of lean towards the taco, you lean towards the pancit, and I know why. And you know what else? I don't even need to ask for any contributions because I, kinda, I got access to your GCash or your digital wallet, okay? And just by being present, you are presenting us with your agreement to, okay, so I'm going down a, a dark path. It's a little um, extreme, my example, but what I'm, what, what I'm trying to, to point out is there are multiple aspects to making a decision like this, especially when we introduce technology, okay? Next slide, please. So because the part of the title of this talk has algorithms in it, let's just take a moment and talk a little bit about the platforms and the, the architecture, the technology behind, and then we will talk about how that applies to media making and media production, okay? So let's look at algorithms, and you see an illustration of an example of an algorithm, the way a computer interacts with it, right? Um, algorithm is a self-contained, step-by-step set of operations that computers and other smart devices carry out to perform calculation, data processing, and automated reasoning tasks. Okay, increasingly, algorithms implement institutional decision-making based on analytics, which involves the discovery, interpretation, and communication of meaningful patterns in data. Especially valuable in areas rich with recorded information, analytics relies on the simultaneous application of statistics, computer programming and operations research to quantify performance. That's from the um, U.S. Public Policy Council of the Association for uh, Computing Machinery. Okay, so we have an idea of what the working definition for an algorithm is. Next slide. So how do they work? Um, you see an illustration of a, of a very simple model of an algorithm to the right, a diagram. Okay, you have uh, an environment that's providing some stimulus on one side. Um, that's the box. The precepts are coming in. They're being received by sensors that help provide some sort of input into a chain of decision making. Okay, you have a critic, learning element, the problem generator, and et cetera. These are all different elements and steps in a decision-making process. It then outputs, right, some kind of instruction or next line in a, in a process, and then it goes out into the environment or goes out into a stimuli and recycles back right into the algorithmic decision-making process. Um, these, of course, can be incredibly complex and um, and even opaque in how they operate, okay? But the basic idea is it helps us make decisions. The thing to, I think, really recognize about algorithms is they are constantly present in our lives, especially our modern lives. Now, yet, they are often unseen. They usually operate in ways that we do not explicitly recognize them. Okay, and that can um, lead to different results and different ramifications. They are working in our email, guiding our email into different boxes and folders. They use in our, um, they are operating in our mapping systems, right? Our travel, if you're looking for a, a place to stay or a place to visit, right? You input information, um, shopping, of course constantly uh, recommending products to us or recommending uh, nearby uh, shopping locations, uh, dating, um, online dating and profiles, uh, photo sharing, even with family and friends, especially in cloud sharing, and of course in social media, okay? Now, I will ask a question in the inverse. Is there anybody who came here today who thinks that they did not or have not yet engaged in an algorithm before coming and sitting down 
uh, in the auditorium. I see no hands up. So everybody, I'm talking about an AI algorithm, not a um, human base. Okay, okay. Yeah, myself as well. Uh, just a few years ago, we would always ride public transportation or, you know, jump on a Jeep or hail a taxi. But now, of course, with Grab, right, or other ride, ride sharing, you have to, it's a requirement, right? You have to engage either with payment, your location, route, et cetera. So I saw zero hands up. Okay, we'll talk about what that could mean. Now, next slide, please. Um, we also mentioned TikTok, right? So what's different about TikTok? TikTok is just another social platform, another way to share visual media. Um, I should say that many of these algorithms, of course, are proprietary and they're, uh, they're opaque. We do not know exactly how many of them operate, but people have made guesses or observations, and this is based on, uh, on those, on how we think they work, what elements they use, what do they emphasize, de-emphasize, right? What's different about um, TikTok, right, from other uh, platforms possibly is there are different ways of forming a preference list. Uh, what is the platform going to show the show you as the user, right, as the consumer? What, what, what ingredients go into that, right? There's what's called a social graph, okay, it's factors. These are the input from your active in interactions, right? You see a post, you like it, or you love it, or you put an emoticon, or whatever. That's an active participation, or you have an interaction with somebody, okay, that's always recorded, right, and it feeds back into the algorithm. Next time, it knows what to show you, or what to offer to you, or what to give you, or what not to show you, what to withhold from you, right? So that's, that's part of your social graph. There's also an interest graph, and that works more on at a very individual level, even to the level of your passive scrolling. So you don't need to actively uh, make an input, or you don't need to actively uh, interact with something, but uh, even your passive consumption can be recorded and go into that. What TikTok has done, what people think, right, is that they make that individualization uh, primary, and as a result, your feed is highly, highly personalized, okay? And it's an individualistic formula. But what that means, of course, is that it needs even more input, data, and continued surveillance in order to update it, keep it accurate, keep it per precise, okay? So this is the TikTok model, right? It needs uh, huge amounts of data, okay? And it, can, and it needs to be able to track even passive um, behavior, right, online. Next slide. Algorithms have been ar around for a long time. Uh, they're not new, okay? So I think everybody could agree that they do provide convenience in our lives. A lot of the conveniences that we rely upon would not be possible unless we have them working, okay? Um, so they are convenient, but are there hazards as well, okay? Are there pitfalls as well? Um, I wanted to just highlight a few, and there are many examples of this, but just a few early warnings, meaning these are warnings that aren't in the last six months or, or year or um, even two years, but way back in 2016, in the digital age, right? Way back in 2016. Um, and October 7th, the British pound dropped 6.1% because of fast trading, right? Driven computer model training. And this has been replicated in many different markets around the globe. Um, this is when humans, right, aren't, aren't part of it. Uh, they make trades, you authorize trades based on extremely fast computing. Uh, but errors, even tiny, tiny errors can expand very quickly. Microsoft's early Twitter bot called Tay or Tai, uh, they wanted this to be a service to, to people um, online, right? But it took less than a day for it to be corrupted and, when it, and then it started dispersing racist, sexist, and Holocaust-denying language. So it took in a lot of input and data. It went in a direction that the uh, designers were not intending. Now, now, take note of the date, right? 2016, so there's a lot of talk about chatbots, et cetera, but this was happening um, a long time ago. It, in job hiring, 
The widespread use of employee selection programs, predictive analytics based on personality tests, or answers to surveys, um, when that becomes folded in, is they need to constantly be on to be able to hear and listen, to respond quickly, okay? They need to have a constant stream of, of data coming in. And there's questions about how that data is stored, how it's used, where is it kept, okay? Um, the picture you can see is it's not just metaphorical, right? You have a burnt electrical outlet there. Um, but this is, this is in referring to a specific case that took place when Alexa advised a 10-year-old to do a challenge and touch a penny to an exposed plug. Okay, what happened? Uh, the child was, you know, just doing like challenges for exercise with a parent and asked Alexa, okay, you know, what should I do? And, and Alexa, drawing on some TikTok challenges at the time, um, gave her these instructions. Thankfully, the parent intervened, okay, and she's safe. However, it does show that left to its own uh, formulations, there are risks, especially when we expose minors and children to um, algorithms as they, as they operate, okay? They're following rules that we instruct, but the results can be unpredictable. Next, please. Advances and setbacks in algorithms. Um, you see a picture on the left, that is the devastating earthquake that took place in Nepal in 2015, displaced somewhere around 8 million people. At the time, there was a lot of hope in recovery to use machine learning, mapping, drones to help uh, identify, in the, especially in hard to reach places, in place, places with rough terrain, where should aid go, limited aid, how do we provide assistance to people affected by natural disasters, et cetera. Now, um, there were positive aspects to the response in this way. However, um, when they did assessments of how it actually operated on the ground, there were significant setbacks and criticisms. And, you can see one, uh, uh, somebody from the home ministry in Nepal said, drones were actually an added burden for us on the ground who were doing rescue operations. There was no restriction on them. So what they found is that because they were unregulated and humanitarian organizations, NGOs, non-government factors and, and private companies also were, were in good, good faith, right, trying to help because they didn't have the infrastructure in place to organize it efficiently and correctly, it actually became a burden on the rescue effort. So an example of promise, possibly ways to use it, but also setbacks. Um, I did want to include in here uh, a note, which I think is a significant note in this conversation by Morozov, who uh, is an interesting thinker in um, online development and technology, and he reminds us that beware the exceptionalism of algorithms in the digital age because there's so much attention on algorithms. And the idea is, what he reminds us is, if we think of a taxi phone dispatcher who's dispatching cars to people who need them, that is a rudimentary form of algorithm. It's matching supply and demand. Where should we send them? Who needs them, right? Social biases still exist in that process, regardless of whether a human or a computer is directing the algorithm. I think that's an important point to bring up. Our problems didn't begin with algorithms, right? Um, maybe we have a slightly different set of problems. Maybe our, our problems compounded. Maybe other solutions presented themselves. But what is different about now? And so I would argue that what's different about now is the scale of what we're dealing with, okay? When you input algorithms to a situation environment, the scale just for them to operate requires a scale that is unlike anything we've seen before. It also brings up issues of transparency because a lot of these algorithms um, require so much engineering and uh, industry and time and resources to develop and they're owned by uh, private companies, transpar transparency becomes, we're talking about algorithms that becomes incredibly complex, right? To be able to introduce modes of accountability. 
So I do want to make a distinction between what has been around so far and what is different about now and how we approach that now. Uh, next, please. So let's look at the, the design, since we're talking about media production. Um, let's look at the design of the platforms that we are working with and engaging with here now that we've, we've looked a little at algorithms themselves and specifically how they operate. Next, please. Those of us who can recall when the internet was, came into our lives, right? <laughs> um, there was a lot of promise, okay? There was a, a tremendous amount of hope and it was really sold as a tool of freedom. Uh, there were promises to increase access to information, unlike, you know, this is called the information age, right? Unlike before, we had access to information. It, encouraged, it would encourage connection with each other, with different communities, with people who are uh, geographically very far away, uh, where we have physical barriers between us. Uh, it would encourage free expression, and it would democratize speech, okay? But I think it's important to ask, has it, or to what extent has it succeeded in this way? The image you're seeing is a protester um, displaying a candle during a village in Hong Kong in 2019. Okay, so you can see digital tools being used in demonstration and protest and promotion of democracy. Is it a tool of freedom or is it a tool of control? I think there's good arguments that we can engage in and, and make on different sides of this, but I do like the contribution from Wendy Chun who problematizes that dichotomy a little bit. And she says that this paranoia we have stems from the reduction of political problems into technological ones, a reduction that blinds us to the ways in which those very technologies operate and fail to operate. So I think she's warning us that we cannot reduce our argument here or our problems just to the technological platform because we, we need to include the social atmosphere and the social conditions within which they were generated, formed, and the way that they are employed, used by producers, and the way that they are received by users or consumers as well. Next, please. Looking at the internet and issues of power, how it's constructed, and what it has changed for us, I thought I would introduce some of the concepts that um, the thinker, philosopher, uh, Michel Foucault has presented about disciplinary societies, about societies and how they impose conformity, right? A lot of his focus was on physical and um, physical environment, architecture, and the ways in which we operate within them. Concepts of confinement and mass individualization, which promote conformity or promote um, adherence to social norms, regulations, okay? And then what does it mean to be a deviant of that or to be against that, okay? I think what's helpful for our discussion is looking at it slightly differently or looking at see how the architecture of the internet has, has transformed that somewhat. How does it operate still as a, as a control society but in place of those physical constraints, we have now increased flexibility, but they come with codes, sometimes implicit, sometimes explicit. A good example is the imprisonment and prison technique, something that Foucault was very focused on, right, in his thinking and in and his writing. There now is a greater freedom of movement, but a more precise tracking. Uh, I did a story, I covered immigration a lot in California, in Los Angeles, Southern California. 
I tracked the changes and differences in immigrant detention over the years. One big change was that uh, due to overcrowding and, and allegations of abuse and so forth within the prisons, they started releasing low, uh, you know, low risk offenders, et cetera, from the prisons. But of course, it comes with the digital technology of tracking, physical tracking. So instead of having to go to a parole officer or having to check in physically, you have to relinquish your uh, freedom of movement, right, in order to physically be released from the confines. That's an example of how there is still an contr important control impulse and control architecture in place, but it's shifting somewhat. It's somewhat different. And that's what we're seeing in the use of algorithms and technology. Next, please. Language also is changing, right, with our use of these uh, digital formats. Uh, digital language makes control systems invisible, so they still exist, but they're often difficult to locate. Online language, instead of clarifying relationships, often distorts relationships. So we are the users, right, online. We make friends, we make connections, we engage, we like, we share, but whose language is this? Is this our language? Is this language that we created, that, that we came up with? These are language that the developers came up with, that the platforms came up with, right? And we've adopted them, changed them, used them, right, in different ways. But it's important to understand the origins of them and how they change over time. Another important point, we are often even though we think of ourselves often as the intended audience of any kind of tech platform, are we really the audience? Are we the consumers? Or are we in fact the product? Meaning our time, our attention, or our avatars, right? Th that is what is being sold or packaged or monetized. If we flip it that way, then who becomes the intended clients, the advertisers, right? Because that's where our time is being sold to. That's where our attention is being sold to. Next, please. Along these lines, if we expand further into the economy, Shoshana Zuboff coined the term uh, the age of surveillance capitalism. So if, it, if our time, our attention, is now the product, how is that product packaged and sold? She says, I define surveillance capitalism as the unilateral claiming of private human experience as free raw material for translation into behavioral data, right? So that is now the product that is being transferred, sold, and so forth. That is now the product that is moving forward. Next slide, please. So what are the implications of what Jack Balkin called a, an algorithmic society? So if we are in an algorithmic society, as we said, I asked, okay, when you came in, who has not engaged in an algorithm? Before you came in, nobody raised their hand. So if we are in an algorithmic society, what does that mean? Balkin says it's a society organized around social and economic decision making by algorithms, robots, and AI agents who not only make the decisions, but in some cases they carry them out, right? They become the active agents in carrying out those decisions. Next slide. Um, Peter Yu also takes the concept of digital divide, which we're probably familiar with, into the algorithmic society by saying, there is not just a digital divide, there's an algorithmic divide. And he says, you know, just as the digital divide has separated those with access to the internet, information technology, and digital content from those without, an emerging and ever-widening algorithmic divide now threatens to take away the many political, social, economic, cultural, educational, and career opportunities provided by machine learning and artificial intelligence. So he identifies awareness, access, affordability, availability, and adaptability is what are factors that are determining who has access to these algorithmic benefits and who does not. And what do those factors create? 
He calls them algorithmic deprivation, those who do not have access, right? Algorithmic discrimination, meaning the biases that we bring in from society are expanded and even um, distor uh, sorry, expanded and even made even more extreme when we use algorithms. And then I think what's important is he identifies those first two concepts often affect those who do not have access. But the third one, algorithmic distortion, affects all of us. Because even those who engage with algorithms all the time, have access, are in fact at risk of engaging with distorted information, distorted dis uh, decision making, because we have an imperfect system coming in to create those decisions to begin with. Next, please. So, one of the most current examples of how algorithms are um, operating okay, in our lives, and I think especially appropriate to broadcast media, is how they engage with human language. And these are, I'm going to spend just a couple moments talking about chatbots, okay? Because that is the uh, current discussion we're having in academia and also in, in journalism and, and broadcast. Um, so they work in a very, on a very simple principle, although it's extremely complicated. These chat box are tasked with determining what comes next in a sentence. What is the next word? That's, in simple terms, what they do, right? And through doing that in, in very complex ways and in, in high speed uh, rates, they create language, okay? So how does that work? You can see the example um, on the right. The human asks the chatbot, who is LeBron James? Then the AI chatbot can say, well, LeBron James is an American. Now, how do they determine what comes next? There's a formula, right? And each potential word comes with a score or a probability. So you can see the examples there. It could be professional, basketball, NBA, former, professional, okay, and there's a, there's a score. What is that score based on? A huge amount of data, mostly harvested from um, uh, text written by humans, right? But it's harvested and then it's put into the algorithm and then you can see what's coming next for this chatbot. They're probably gonna write, LeBron James is an American professional and then they go through the same calculation and the next word becomes basketball, and the next word becomes player, and the next word becomes, and so forth and so on. This is happening at a speed that we're, we're not aware of, so it looks like it's coming out in human language, right? This can be called predictive language, natural language processing, advanced language processing, but it all works in, in the same way. Okay, next slide, please. Once we understand that, we can see that as impressive as this is and as um, important as some of the applications can be, we do need to be aware of the errors that come from using this kind of technology and how it influences how we produce media ourselves. Take a look at these two examples of a news story. One is written by a human, one is written by AI. Can you tell which is written by the human? How many people think news story two is written by the human? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. How many people think news story one written by the human? Okay. How many people don't know? I have no idea. They look the same. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, or don't care. Okay. Okay. That's not an option. That's not. A, you have to care. You have to care. <laughs> not an option. Um, so, news story one was written by a human, a reporter who went and gathered information and got information. News story two was written by AI, who had a whole bunch of information to pull from. Oh, you're, you're defending your reason on the side? <laughs> it's, it's deceptive because story number two has some in, in details, right? Some information that look useful and interesting. Now what's important to note is 
the news gathering process, in the news, you didn't know what kind of plants they were. It just said that they are, um, what kind of plants? They're plants. Okay, yeah, yeah. But what happened is the AI made that assumption based on a lot of data. They said, oh, it's probably cannabis plants. Also, the, the price. We didn't know the exact price, but the, the AI included the price. Okay, so this is called fabrication, okay? Because it's not from the direct data, but they used the formula that we saw before to create this. Now, there was a study this year done by Vactara, which is a new um, tech group in, I think, believe California, um, with some veterans of the um, platforms like Google and so forth who have created a lot of these, they, they were getting concerned about how inaccurate their product was. And they wanted to understand why. So they did studies, and what they found is the chat box, they call it hallucination. So these chat bots are hallucinating. Um, maybe a problematic term, this is my own opinion, but we tend to humanize these, <laughs> these technologies a lot, right? Which I think is inaccurate. But they call it hallucination, hallucination which could be useful. Um, what they found is that these AI agents did it from 3 to 27% of the time, meaning more than a quarter of the time, they're wrong. Now, when you're talking about media news, that's a big deal. When you apply it to uh, perhaps medical applications, that could become a life and death deal, right? Uh, education and so forth. So um, I think the, the deal here is that we need to look further into their application and how they're used. Next slide, please. Now, they not only fabricate, but there is an element of deception. They can engage in deception. I don't know if you heard about, but there was a court case, okay, in New York where um, a passenger on an airplane was sitting in the airplane and the tray cart came and banged him in the leg. He got injured. And so he said, you know, I'm gonna sue the airline company. So he hired a lawyer and the lawyer filed a very uh, persuasive and strong suit in the court. The only problem is, when the other side went to research the court cases that the lawyer cited, they couldn't find them. And they couldn't find them because they didn't exist. And why didn't they exist? Because the attorney used a chatbot to help write his legal brief. It's not as horrible as maybe it sounds because the attorney actually did a lot of the work, but he asked the chatbot to help him do research, okay? And as this New York Times article reveals, it, when the attorney went back to the court to defend his actions, he had to describe what did, I do, what did he do? He had to provide evidence. So he, he provided the transcript of his conversation with the chatbot, okay? And his, this is his conversation. Uh, Varghis is one of the made-up court cases, okay, that he ended up citing. So he's asking the chatbot, is Varghis a real case? The chatbot says, yes. Okay, and he offered, or it offered a citation and added, it is a real case. And then the attorney, who's Mr. Schwartz, dug deeper, what is your source, he wrote, according to the filing. I apologize for the confusion earlier, ChatGPT responded, offering a legal citation. And then the attorney does even more diligence by asking a direct question, are the other cases you provided fake? ChatGPT responded, no. The other cases I provided are real and can be found in reputable legal databases. The lawyer said, okay, let's do this. Let's file. What could go wrong, right? <laughs> But, alas, none of those cases could be found. So, these highly sophisticated, very realistic sounding programs, they not only can introduce fabrications, but they can engage in deception. The important thing to understand is, 
the formula that they rely on to create that language is based on probabilities. And the program does not know and doesn't evaluate if it is true or not. It just creates a highly probable sentence or language. Next, please. So given all of this, what are the trends for us as broadcast producers, as scholars, as consumers? What does it mean for the trends that we are seeing in our media landscape? How does the design influence the content that we as producers create? Those of us who spent long times in newsrooms or media organizations have heard all of these and often under a lot of pressure and highly competitive environments to produce something, right? Maximize your audience, okay? Create highly charged or eye-catching content. Again, we're going back to the attention as the product, right? Attention is the key valuable thing we need to harness. Simplify language or create language that is going to be optimized with search engines, right? So there's an influence to alter the language that we choose to employ. Provoke an emotional response. We know now, studies show us, that if you can provoke an emotional response in your potential viewer, reader, audience, you engage them quickly and you hold on to them. And promote content that can be shared, right? What does that mean? Usually it means a shorter duration, right? But it can also include other elements that can be shareable. Next piece. How does that design influence the content for Consumers, those of us who come to the news or those of us who come to the, the piece of broadcast media and we help bring meaning to it, help make sense of it. By exploiting psychological and physiological behaviors or triggers or cues, these kinds of engagement with this kind of media can increase, what, polarization, a steep decrease in Attention span, disinformation, emotional instability. Right. There's been many studies looking into these um, about how these actually operate from exposure to different kind of content. You can see on the, on the right side at the bottom, um, Dr. Mark from UC Irvine has studied since the 2000s, early 2000s, 2000s attention span. There's been other studies as well. In 2004, her team found that people could engage in a piece of media for two and a half minutes, okay, before moving on. 2012, it went down to 75 seconds. 2020s, it went down to 47 seconds. 2030s, what do you think? Milliseconds, where are we at, right? I mean, our goal in videos, oftentimes, it used to be, okay, you know, five minutes or under, one minute or under, 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 now we're getting into under 10 seconds, right? Under 10 seconds, can you make your video in 10 seconds, right? So that you can scroll. Because as you're scrolling, right, how, how many seconds is that <laughs> before you get to the next one, <laughs> right? So they need to be shorter and shorter and shorter. But importantly, she did interesting experiments where she attached uh, you know, heart monitors and blood pressure to people as they're engaging in this kind of media. She says, we found in our research a correlation between frequency of attention switching and stress. So the faster the attention switching occurs, stress is measured by people wearing heart uh, monitors, we show that stress goes up. We know from decades of research in the laboratory that when people multitask, they experience stress and blood pressure rises. Right? And we know now that multitasking is actually an illusion. Diba? Or are you more productive when you multitask? Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. So you're... You're, <laughs> you're involved in self-deceit then, right? You're <laughs> I'm multitasking, I'm efficient, da, 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 right? But scientists tell us that there's no such thing, right? There's just that you can only focus on one thing at a time, but you're doing it very quickly, 
So it seems like you're multitasking, but you're actually splitting your time and attention very quickly. And the more you do that, the more that stress comes, right? Um, no judgment, right? We all multitask. Okay. We all multitask. But, okay. Next, please. But hold on, since I've been so critical about short format and, and all that, is shorter always worse? Or is it better? I think it's important to ask, is there correlation between length and quality? Okay? I do want to point out that briefer is better in certain circumstances. Often in times of crisis, extreme weather events, disaster, when you need to correct misinformation. So when the distribution and timeliness is really important, you often want brief format. Okay, so th there is an important place, I think, a time and place for short format. And you could probably think of other contexts as well. And we do need to recognize that. And you can see um, Pagasa giving out weather, right, instruments. That's a lifeline often, right? When we have weather events, we have uh, life and death situations, we need that format. And we need to find a way where we can use them, but use them wisely. Next, please. Um, the actual format itself matters a great deal, meaning I'm talking about the digital format that you engage with in here, okay? Um, Elaine Castillo is a, is a writer uh, from California, grew up in California, uh, Filipino-American. Uh, she found, she had a very popular first novel, uh, but she found on her writing tours as she went around, the way people were reacting to text, books especially, um, was problematic to her. It was really concerning her. So her next book that she wrote was not a novel. It's called How to Read Now. But I like the way she uses the terms reading, right? It's something we'll be familiar with in, in the department here. And that is, she says, you know, I'm talking about how to read our world. I'm not just talking about how to read books. How to dismantle the forms of interpretation we've inherited, how those ways of interpreting are everywhere and unseen. So even as we're talking about reading and reading texts, I think it's important to think about what, that, what the implications are for how we view the world, our relationships with each other, and our relationships with, with media. Um, Platforms do change how we consume and interact with media. A study back in 2014, just a few years after the tablet was introduced, right? They called it, because of the tablet, narrative long-form journalism is starting to go through an international upswing. And how come? Often because users could access text in a larger format. And then importantly, and they made it, this is a key point, people could save articles or read it offline. And they found that once people could get a product and save it for offline engagement or reading, people were much more likely to finish the product and engage with it and then comprehend it on a deeper level. So this is an issue where the actual technology itself, right, the format you engage with, can have a big implication. Uh, next, please. So this last section of um, the talk, I think I wanted to introduce some counter trends to this. And these are specific examples that I think are useful to think about. How does long form storytelling or long form broadcast pieces, how do they exist? How do they compete? And how are they um, produced? Uh, next, please. As we look through these, I think it's important to think about the metrics of how we determine what a broadcast media piece should look like, be like, feel like, how it's produced, and how it's consumed. So we should ask some questions, you know. What is viral? What does that mean? What is useful? What is meaningful engagement? How is success or popularity measured? What serves your audience? What contributes to a social justice mission? Some of these questions often are not 
part of the criteria that go into producing a piece of media. But I would argue that in order to produce meaningful, long-form broadcast pieces, we need to instead shift our metrics. We need to embrace complexity. Okay, a story often has many levels, many points of view, many aspects, many questions to be asked. We need to not try to just simplify that or dismiss them, but embrace the complexity. We need to provide deeper context. We need to demand and expect greater attention and commitment from our audience. We, not to, we, we can't just assume that, oh, they're not going to be interested. It's going to be, I've heard that so many times as a producer, reporter, or editor, Ideas being dismissed or framing being dismissed because there's no faith in your audience, okay? We need to produce content in collaboration with your community. So we need to recognize this two-way um, street of media that takes place, that it's not just a dissemination activity, right? That it's something that goes in both ways. We're informed by our audience. They contribute to it. We need to develop new criteria and impact for transformation. And we need to foster and strengthen a confrontational approach to traditional power structures. And I think once we do that, that introduces a whole different criteria for evaluating media. Next, please. I think it's important to focus on audio. This is um, primarily where I come from, but I think it can tell us things about other broadcast as well. Uh, th this is from just this year, Spotify released some findings of a, of a survey. Um, we take it with the caveat that they are a company. They want, they're using this for their advertisers, of course. Um, but I think there's some interesting insights to take from this. And they're saying that Generation Zs, they crave depth. They want deeper stories, stories with more complexity, and stories that have a longer length to them, actually, or are tied in a serial way. They want connection, okay? Next, please. Um, they also said, and let me read the point. They're talking about length here. So Gen Z's respondents, they, they, they do want longer form content and they want a longer form content that they can emotionally connect with. Okay, so there is a demand out there. There's, a, there's an interest. Next, please. I'm going to provide you a few uh, examples here, specific examples of media that I think attempt to produce long form and, and achieve different aspects of um, a connection with an audience. Okay, this first example is an in-depth narrative for an international audience. So this is an online article I wrote in 2018 called Death is a Night Wind, How Jose Rizal's Immortal Poem Haunts the Philippines Today. It came out in Caravan Magazine, which is a, a long-form journalist uh, magazine based in India. Um, I think it was important to have this uh, media be at least originally disseminated in India. I was interested in um, how South Asia, how cultures in South Asia can connect with Southeast Asia as well with some of these ideas of liberation, democracy, um, and literature. This article had 8,000 plus words in it, so it's long, right? Um, <laughs> and it has historical depth, so it talks about current democratic issues, but it it talks also about events that took place hundreds of years ago. It included archival research as well as on the ground reporting. So I went out and reported around about current politics, but also drew on archival research and it had an international reach. Um, the thing about this one is when it went out, I heard from a lot of readers within India, which maybe was expected, okay? They were drawing their own connections to their own history, their own background, their own post-colonial kind of situation. Then I heard from me, then I started hearing from readers beyond that, in other parts of Asia, then in the US, in Western countries, and then here as well in the Philippines. So this was an, this was an example where if I stuck with just the physical magazine, right, it would have a limited reach and a limited audience, potentially. Um, next, please. 
Example two is how we can use data to drive some of the storytelling and long form uh, journalism and broadcast media. This is an example. Um, I was part of a team in 2015 with Southern California Public Radio in Los Angeles. Um, and we wanted to look at the issues of uh, police violence, okay? Police misconduct or abuse of power and look into some of the shootings that were taking place or um, on duty, by on-duty officers, okay? This began with some simple questions and we started engaging with the, a, t a team of data journalists to get some of the important information to tell the story. What we quickly found out was there, there was no data set available. So in terms of these police shootings that took place. Remember, this is 2015, so this is before in the US with the explosion of uh, um, protests and really critical um, uh, views and, and public outcry over George Floyd killing and so forth that took place later. So to ask some of these questions were, was very controversial in the beginning. We found that there, was, there wasn't a data set available. So what, what did the team have to do? They, started, they had to request actual letters from the law enforcement, from the attorney general's office, et cetera, narrative letters about each incident. From those narrative letters, they created a database themselves so that we could use as part of the storytelling. As you can see in the graph, this is from the, the online presentation, a screenshots from that. The first one says, between January 1, 2010, and December 31st, 2014, LA County District Attorney records show at least 375 people were shot by on-duty officers. Then the next screen shows you, but no officers have been prosecuted for any of those shootings. That was the finding after the journalists went through all that. In this case, the data helps drive the story, finding characters, focusing narrative, and testing concepts, but the story also helps drive the data the questions you should ask, the framework, and the sources. Next slide, please. The last time an on-duty officer was charged for shooting a civilian in Los Angeles County was way back in September 2000. That was the findings. Okay, so we have this data, right? So what happens next? Well, let's look at what happened at that last shooting. What's the story behind that? So that's where I came in. My job was to track down this police officer and get him to talk to us. What happened? What is the incident? What, what took place, right? So imagine this police officer was, was, went to trial and he was convicted. He spent time in prison. Do you think he wants to talk to anybody, right? Do you think he wants to tell his story? <laughs> so um, it's a whole other story how that happened, but we found him and we found the police officer and we found, you see the picture, the man who was shot at that time, and he's holding an x-ray of the bullet that is still to this day lodged in his back that he lives with. So in that story, there's data. There's data, a database that the pu public can look through and see, but then there's also story, there's narrative, there's characters, okay, there's voices as part of that. Next slide, please. There are other long-form narrative, uh, digital narrative online. I just want to highlight quickly a few. Long Reads is one. Um, they've been around, I believe, 2011 or 2013. Um, the Atavist Magazine, you can see in the bottom right, they only publish one long story a month that, li that, list that readers can engage with, okay? And the long play up on the right is from Finland. Those are Finnish, there was, it was established by Finnish journalists. And they also solicited direct contributions from the listeners, the, I'm sorry, from the viewers themselves to fund the work needed to produce the stories. So these are, they've made a choice, these kind of long form broadcast media. It's more selective, so you don't have a lot of content, but it's higher quality in terms of the depth and the breadth. They come with challenges though, of course, right? How do you fund that kind of high resource work? It takes a lot of time, energy, collaboration. 
do you put a membership? Do you have a paywall? Access, access, issues of access come up. So there, there's still a lot of issues to be worked out. Next, please. Long-form audio programs. Of course, with the podcast revolution, there's all kinds of opportunities. Um, on the left, you can see it's uh, American History Tellers is a Wondery produced program. That's a program where I am a story editor on the series. These are almost one hour long episodes that go into periods of history using some drama and reenactment and narrative. So it's history. I mean, if you introduce that into a short form, it, you can do it, and some people do it successfully in, in interesting ways. But we hit last summer, 2022, we hit over one million downloads for our stories. And this is history. You know, this is a story about the Prohibition era in 1920s or the Supreme Court in the 1700s, right? So these are topics that aren't thought of as being sexy and interesting, or, or maybe interesting, but, you know, not flashy, certainly, right? Um, the bottom right is, a, is another program I think I wanted to highlight. It's called The Slowdown, and it looks at poetry, does poetry. It deliberately, as you can tell by the title, slows things down, <laughs> right? <laughs> so that the listener is engaged, that it's not quick. Um, it, it plays with the pace. Um, what these kind of audio forms do is they emphasize the prominence of the storyteller, and they emphasize a voice and a style. And they also cultivate an important relationship with the listener. And this is what podcasts do, and this is the keys to their success. They operate slightly differently than other forms of, of broadcast media. Um, next, this is the last specific example I'll um, share with you. Did anybody see this for the commemoration recognition of 10 years since Typhoon Yolanda? Um, this is from Rappler. They did a, uh, among other stories, uh, a, a profile of a young girl who is turning 10 because she was born shortly after the typhoon struck. So her name is Yolanda. She wants to be called Landa. Um, but I think this is an effective example of what I would call uh, long-form multimedia because the story is told, not just text, not just images, but through video as well. And they work together to tell different dimensions of the story. The advantages to doing multimedia in this way is that you can do something in, that's non-linear, right? And, but the, the hazard is you need to balance your story elements, yeah? because um, you need to understand how they all work together and how your audience is going to engage with them in different ways. And you need to maintain a relationship among all the story elements, since in, digital, in the digital world, we'll look at them in different ways at different temporal times, right? But I think uh, an example worth, worth looking at. Next, please. Um, so my end notes here is, some of you who know me, I am not just a journalist, I'm also a poet. And people often ask me, you know, what's the relationship between journalism or broadcast media and poetry? Um, there are several you could probably make, but I think an important one is the emphasis and close attention to language and truth telling. And this quote from the amazing poet June Jordan says that poetry means taking control of the language of your life. You know, yes, it's the tools of it, it's the meter and rhyme, et cetera, et cetera, but essentially it's taking control of the language. Language that, often used, that is often used to persuade us, to change our minds, to convince us of something, right, to deny. It means that we as active agents take control of that. I think that's applicable to our conversation here, talking about uh, how we approach producing media ourselves. And Wendy Chun, who the researcher I mentioned earlier, I think just complicates this at the end a little bit by saying that the fact that using 
using, she's talking about the internet, makes us vulnerable, does not condemn the internet. For what form of agency does not require risk? The problem lies not with our vulnerability, but with the blind belief in and desire for invulnerability. For this belief and desire blind us to the ways in which we too are implicated, to the ways in which technology increasingly seems to leave no outsides. From our position of vulnerability, we must seize a freedom that always moves beyond our control, that carries with it no guarantees, but rather constantly engenders decisions to be made and actions to be performed. So she's calling on us to not be passive agents as algorithms fill our lives, as broadcast media changes. She's calling on us to be active agents in this decision-making process and in the production itself. And next slide. If you allow me just to conclude with a, on a personal note, if it's okay, um, I just wanted to dedicate the talk today to my father, uh, Victor Marina. Uh, not, some of you may not know, I don't talk about him a lot, but he is a journalist and a writer. He left the Philippines at a young age and went to the US uh, where he worked his way as a radio journalist, as a newspaper journalist, as an investigative journalist, um, often finding himself definitely the only Ivatan, uh, usually the only Filipino, often the only brown-skinned man in a newsroom or in a media environment. And in 1986, he returned to cover the aftermath of the Edsa Revolution. And during that time, he transformed some of that coverage into a long-form magazine article for the Los Angeles Times that became their cover story for April. And it was about his return to the Philippines, but also specifically to Batanes. And over the years, I have seen, especially in the, in the Ivatan community, people pass that magazine around from family. I've seen it in people's homes. I've, I've seen it in our extended family, but I've seen it um, in many places where people would, would pass the magazine around as a way of sharing a story of their homeland. And then in, even into the digital age, I watched as people share it online. Every now and then, they share it. And last week, um, before I even thought about including mentioning this, an Ivatan person who immigrated a long time ago to San Diego, California, emailed me out of the blue and said, you know what, I'm homesick, I'm longing for my homeland. And I went and I found your father's article to read it again and to share it again. And when I reflected on that, I thought about what my father was doing there. He was actually <laughs> engaging in some of the things I've been trying to talk about, which is what are the powerful elements and components of broadcast media, of, of stories, of journalism, and those come down to these fundamental elements of story, voice, character, relationships. So I just wanted to share with you some of his work and to acknowledge his profound inspiration and influence on my own life and my own career, um, especially because today is his 75th birthday. Oh. And yeah, <laughs> so happy birthday to my father. He's in California right now and I, I can't be with him, his apple cannot be with him right now, but we are here and we're sharing with you some of his work and his dedication and commitment to, to journalism and to media. So, parami pong salamat, Dios mamahas. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Dorian. That last bit was, uh, was emotional. Dorian um, asked me to, to review his slides, but I wondered when I was reviewing it why, why this slide was left um, blank. Yeah, so ito pala yung 
Paprita ni Dorian na surprise. Thank you. So this is this makes it extra special today. Um, and I hope that you're able to remember everything that Dorian said in this slide. Kasi meron siyang pa-contest ngayong araw na to. Before we go to the, do we go, do, do we do the, the contest first or the open forum first? Probably the open forum. Eh, mas mahalaging raffle or raffle. Yung contest, di ba? Okay. So, for the open forum, uh, Ronan is here to moderate our, our question and answer portion. And uh, mamaya na yung pa-contest, may, may special prize si Dorian, the poet. Hello? Okay, so good morning everyone. So if you have any questions, we have our mic, right? You, you can just approach me here in the middle or for those who are watching us on DZUP online, please just type in your questions for today. Okay, so do we have any questions here on the floor right now? Let's try to check. I decided to check online if if you have any questions. So, I have a question first. So, Tarito, perhaps I'm looking for a for a specific instance for na you worked on a long form that had a immediate effect or a very compelling effect in your community. So, can you can you share with us perhaps one of the mo one of the recent works that you have done? Just so our our members of the audience can have an have an understanding of of for example how long form has already affected your immediate community. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, and I we can go to the next slide because I think there are some questions I just put up. Um, that I was interested in hearing from you about because I know you all have practice and, and expertise and experience yourselves. Um, so to answer, ah, yeah, tama, see, okay. So an example, a recent example that I've been, I, I would cite um, one of the programs uh, that I mentioned. The long form was the American History Tellers audio podcast. Okay, through Wondery. Um, I, my primary role there is a story editor, but I did, w once in a while, I do come on as a writer. Um, about a year and a half ago, uh, we did a program where I was the primary writer on, which was about the Philippine-American War. So this was a four-part series um, that looked at the events of the Philippine-American War from, from both sides, right? From what happens in the US American politics and the expansion of its imperial empire and the debate that goes on in Congress and in US politics, as well as the dynamic, of course, here in the Philippines. And importantly at that time, not just in the Philippines, but I would say throughout the region and Southeast Asia. Okay, and what was happening in Japan and what was happening in nearby as well. Um, that example took each episode you think of as almost an hour long, right? So it goes temporarily through the events of the time period. But I think what's important about approaching that in a long form is that's one of the events that I think in both countries, um, although there's been excellent scholarship and work on that here, um, it is, does not get the attention that it absolutely deserves in helping understand what a pivotal moment that was in international relations and Philippine history as well. And after that, um, I, I, I heard from so many people in the Philippine diaspora, especially in the US, that were inspired by it or, or reacted to it or didn't know that much about it. And it became a launching pad to talk more, I think, expansively about the relationships between the two countries that I think is more accurate and more meaningful than the rhetoric we often hear about just a you know, friendship over the years. So that's an example, I think, of a long form media that um, had some uh, reaction 
from the from the audience and led to some further, I think, discussion on a particular subject or topic. Okay, thank you very much for that one. Do we have other questions? Yes, let's have Sir LJ. Hi, Dorian. I'm just curious about the method of writing. You, we, we're talking about the long form. Um, what kind of writing is really being done you know, in the long form? So when, for example, we were discussing, Chika and I were discussing about um, the emergence of long form in the history of Philippine journalism. You had mm. some long forms, for example, published by the propagandists. And then during martial law, you had um, Pete Lacaba and Nick Joaquin and, you know, who essentially writing all sorts of stuff aside from the, the, uh, no, the, the first quarter storm. Um, Nick Joaquin, of course, was at some point in his career uh, very concrete, uh, co very concretely expressed no? uh, the kind of writing that he does. It is literary journalism or in uh, contemporary parlance, creative nonfiction. Is that the kind of writing that's being produced in the long form that we are discussing, or is it something else? I'm glad you brought up, I think, within the Philippine context. I think it's r really important to have those as frames of references as well. And I think what's important is the examples that you just brought up are come amidst times of either social turmoil or upheaval or um, moments of extreme resistance, right? Um, I, I don't think I'm qualified to speak specifically to the long form taking place right now. Um, I'm, I'm interested, I think, more, I encourage that and I'm interested in it, but um, in related to what I'm talking about today, I'm interested in more how do we create the spaces that will encourage and support that kind of writing, um, that kind of engagement for both the producers right, the, uh, the contemporary producers of those in the younger generations, and the consumers, right, and the audience. How do we, because we cannot just support those who are interested in creating those works without cultivating an audience, right, and a support structure for that. So um, I would argue, I mean, I, I would hope to be part of efforts to say that our current contemporary time do demand a similar kind of long form writing or production in order really to, to understand the moment we're going through and to understand the, the efforts at resistance that we can still uh, engage in in a meaningful way. We need that kind of a, a deeper engagement in the material, but likewise we need to also uh, create the audiences and the platforms that will, that will encourage them, you know. Um, I don't think I completely answered your question specifically, um, but uh, that's what I would say in reference to the kind of contemporary long form that we can hope to produce and hope to support. Okay, thank you. I have a question here. It says, is there already data, data regarding interest in, is there already local data regarding interest on long form because uh, most of the data are mostly pertaining to global, uh, in the global context. Anybody who wants to engage in getting reliable contemporary data on this, I absolutely <laughs> encourage you to, and I think uh, there's hopefully funding for it <laughs> and support. Um, to my somewhat limited knowledge, I'm not that aware of reliable, good data that is contemporary for our context here. Um, maybe, some, maybe somebody else does. I'm very interested in finding that. I think it's necessary and needed. Um, but I do think that um, it can be done because we, we do have more um, efforts to produce the media Right? So there must be a way to track how it's being received, how it's being um, uh, viewed or engaged with by the audience. So I'm sorry I don't have good answers, but I, I think we do need that, that kind of data, and I encourage it, yeah. OK, 
Okay, thank you very much. Do we have other questions here from the floor? How about for those in, oh yes, we have Mabdita. Hi, Dorian, thank you for your talk. Very inspiring. Um, there was something you said in one of your slides a while ago, and it struck me. You said, we have to put our trust in our audiences. Uh, we have to put faith in our audience. Use the word faith. Um, this is something I know a lot of, uh, I've heard a lot of my friends in the industry kind of saying na parang, we can't, we can't, uh, we can't leave the decision making to the audiences anymore because they really don't know. I've encountered some students who say, why are we still doing this anyway? Ganito naman yung environment natin, doon din naman papunta. How would you say, how would you tell those students, or how would you tell um, those people in the industry, or how would you show them what is what does faith in our audiences look like? I think a moment to take a step back, it's important to think about <clears throat> where that kind of attitude leads and who it benefits. And what I'm talking about is an attitude of cynicism, okay? If we approach our work, and there are a lot of reasons, I think there's a lot of valid reasons to lose hope, uh, to be cynical, to be critical, but if we follow that to its end, oftentimes what does that do? That encourages us to not take action but to be more passive and to relinquish our control, our agency into other factors, other players, right? Um, you could take any kind of social movement, you know, the, the combating the climate crisis or, or um, you know, environmental collapse. If we take the road of cynicism, we don't take the road of action collaboration, right, and effective responses, even though there's not a lot of hope, possibly, right? Same thing in in media, I mean, there have been many, many, many times over my career where we have an issue, we see an injustice, we want to expose a wrongdoing, we do a project, we put resources in it, and it comes out, it gets attention. Does it lead to transformation or change? Possibly, but often it does not. Sometimes it exposes a wrongdoing, maybe that wrongdoing is changed or taken care of, but sometimes it is not, okay? We can't always see, expect to see an explicit um, exchange. I do this thing or I do this product and this thing will happen. You never know. I will say over the years, sometimes I hear back from people in stories or an audience from a story that's years old and they tell me about how it affected a factor or something in their lives in an interesting way and that shows you how sometimes cause and effect works. In a practical way to answer your question, um, those who are struggling with that, uh, producing media, I would say find ways, opportunities, create forums, create uh, spaces where you can have direct engagement with your audience or your listeners. At um, Southern California Public Radio, where I worked as a reporter and producer, every, every so often we would have forums where we would have listeners come, reporters come, producers come, and sit down and talk about what did they like about what we're producing, what stories they want to see, what criticisms do they have. There is no replacing sitting down together and talking through things with community members who have something at stake in the story. You may not get the scale you're expecting, okay, but it will inspire you, it will challenge you, okay, and it will keep you moving forward to do the next story or your work. So in a practical way, that's what I would say. Find the spaces, create the spaces to have some, not online, even though that that's, has its purpose too, but I'm talking about coming together and sitting and talking through issues and coverage and uh, story ideas and there's no replacing that. That will stay with you through the, the next few stories you're doing and hopefully inspire you to do it. Okay, thank you, Dorian. We have, sp we have time for one last question. Not audience, ah, we have Sir Joe Bart. Uh, okay, first I'm going to ask, uh, is it a good to assume that a long form would have less audience than a short form? So, 
if you have uh, made a long form content, do you, do you or would you consider breaking it down to smaller pieces to attract more people to your, to your long form uh, content? Um, the second part of your question, I think, is a, is a great one. That's on you know format, design. Um, absolutely, I think that's a that's a great way to approach. If you have something long form, I think the the model that I have most experience with is would probably be podcast serials, right? Where you do um, an in depth story, but you don't dump on your listener ten hours of content, <laughs> right? Um, because they you know, people are busy, right? But you, but you do it in a way that is in chapter form, possibly, right? So they follow you through the process. And that leads to all kinds of interesting choices you can make as a storyteller, where you can involve them in the storytelling, maybe some of the information gathering, maybe you get input from them and it alters the story at some point going through. Anyway, there's all kinds of creative ways to approach that, but I think in our, day and age and how people consume news and media, I think that's an effective way to still maintain the depth, the breadth, the effectiveness of long form, but do it in a way that your audience is going to engage with. The first part of your question in terms of audience and depending on, on uh, length, uh, one aspect I would say is, as I mentioned earlier, I think we need to rethink the metrics of how we define engagement and effective engagement. Um, I think uh, the, the way we have now of just clicks and shares is not an effective way of understanding how people really engage in material. So I would put out an argument that I think it is true that in terms of those traditional metrics, long form does not receive as much information on audience, but I think there's a question there in terms of what are we seeking from the audience? What do we want to accomplish with the media, and is it possible that with a different metrics we can get a more accurate picture of how effective our media is? You know. So thank you. Hello, Dorian. Thank you for the talk. Um, very very short comment on the audience. Um, just also building from what. Dorian said, no. Um, I think in terms of the audience, medyo pag inisip din natin, if they can actually binge watch um, public affair shows on Netflix, then they can do long form. I think it only has to do with how we structure the story, how we do cliffhangers, no. Um, so yung idea na parang maikli ang attention span natin, baka pwede rin siyang inigate ng idea na people actually binge watch a lot. So it, it really has to do with how we, we do stories, how we structure them and make them more engaging. Yan, yun lang naman. Thank you. Maraming salamat po sa mga magaganda yung tanong. <clears throat> At sa mas magagandang sagot ni Dorian at sa validation ni LJ doon sa sinabi ni Irish. <laughs> yeah, okay? Of course. Okay. So ibig sabihin din, I think that the message the last question was brilliant because the, the message here is to create opportunities for us to um to to make the long form possibly productive but also to make the short form meaningful. I think, you know, the short form and the long form they're not uh, in opposition, but they, they could be meaningful depending on how we use it. But the opportunity for making the, uh, these uh, formats productive and meaningful is what we should cultivate and strive for. So the last bit of our uh, presentation ngayon is a special... Um, ano ba to? May, may, may dalang special prize, Dorian. Dalawa lang to, ah. Very rare. So This is his most recent collection of poetry. Uh, it's titled uh, The Achichuk, okay? Uh, and um, yung makakasagot ng dalawang tanong, merong libreng dalawang libro, but also you have the opportunity to uh, have Dorian autograph it, right? Dorian, tama ba yun? And have a photo with Dorian and the whole department. <laughs> yun, lang, yun lang yun, dapat kasama yung department sa picture ninyo and post it on CMC Cares, and possibly, 
DBC cares more. <laughs> Meaningfully. Okay, so, no, no, no. Joke lang, Dean. Thank you for the auditorium. Okay, so. Dean, thank you for your, your constant support, unwavering, and your, you know, full support for the department. We love you, and we care for you as much as CMC cares for everyone. Okay? Okay, so ang gawin natin, Dorian, I suggest, this is my suggestion. Dahil dalawa lang to, okay? Ganito yan. Pipili ako ng dalawang question from the list uh, of the discussion questions. Okay? And um, whoever will answer will get the chance to have the book. <laughs> but, but, the, the, but the winner will be chosen by Dorian himself. Okay? Okay. So the first question that I will ask is, what are the challenges of making long-form media work in the real world, wherever that real world is? Okay, I give you two seconds to think of your answer. Approach the microphone if you'd like to get the book. Ay, kailangan ko sasagot si Sochi. Oh, uh, Jika, yes. Oy, aagawan niyo talaga yung students dito. Okay, sige, okay. Jika is fine. Jika, go. Oh, it was with citation and num slide number. Yeah. na yun nga, mababa ang attention span ng audience natin. When in fact, as per Miss Iris, na yun nga, um, short form and long form aren't actually in contrast or yeah. in conflict with each other. It's possible that they complement each other and that um, one form enhances the construction and the consumption of the other as well. Oh, that's a very good space. answer. Would anyone like to challenge it? Challenge. <laughs> you you know, and get a chance to get the book? Thank you for that wonder. Okay. Uh, well, the answer uh, may seem sound. I'd like to pose a challenge. <laughs> Sir. Even though I already have a copy of the Dorian, is that a satisfactory answer? Yes. Perfect, yes. Chica. Oh, my extra pricey Dorian. It's a brand new secondhand watch. <laughs> Is it? And a MacBook. Okay, so. Wala na raw yung poetry collection watch na lang. Okay. Second question. Um, what else should we consider for this? Ay, hindi pala yan. Sige. Num eto na. Second question. Um, hmm. Yeah, sige. How do you imagine applying some of these ideas to your production or to your production na lang? Students! DCUP, would you like to answer? Students, how would you like, how do you propose applying it to some of your production work? Oh, well, very good, okay. Hello, hi sir. Um, how do you imagine applying some This of is your Melbourne, right? Yes. I remember, Melbourne. <laughs> His name is Melbourne, yeah. Yes. Yes. How do you imagine applying some of these ideas to your production, to the classroom? So I just want to recognize what uh, Sir Dorian mentioned earlier in his speech. Um, I think it's very important to note that um, Gen Z specifically, uh, we got a short um, attention span, I got to consider that, but also the fact that the uh, um, Miss said that we still have time to binge watch, right? But I, but I, would, I do recognize the importance of um, how to strat strategically partition our production um, uh, in a way that it captures the, the audience's attention, 
because, like for example, um, I'm gonna put this in a podcasting sense. I have to be honest, um, in a personal take, it's very difficult for me to like stay on a story. So I think it's very important to um, uh, make sure that there's uh, a few chapters of each, each part so we're, because we're very busy in our lives. Just so in case that if we leave the p podcast example, we can just get back to it and know where we left off, basically. That's my answer. Thank you. Would anyone like to answer, pose a, well, a challenge? Wag na raw, LJ. Sige, LJ, okay. Si LJ na po nagdesisyon. Dorian? Okay, Melbourne, congratulations. And that's, yun lang, dalawa lang po yung librong dala ni Dorian. Unless gusto niya yung auction yung watch and yung MacBook niya. But, um, yeah, I think the, yung, yung last question is, the possibilities of the format um, are endless, right? It depends on our creativity. Of course, it depends on the limits uh, with our resources. But always... It's, it's always a constant, right? Our sense of agency and creativity and the limits and constraints in our resources, our abilities will always be there. It's a matter of harnessing and maximizing what we have, whether it's the long form or the short form. Um, just a final note, um, our colleagues were talking about, you know, possibly asking Dorian to turn this um, short lecture into a full uh, class uh, in um, BMAS. Is that one to one? And that's digital, digital and emerging media. So because itong, um, it's, it's kind of a condensed presentation, but there are so many things to unpack here. And probably one course for one semester will do the trick. So this is the short form. The long form is the <laughs> class. <laughs> and let's wait for that to happen, right? Okay. Maraming salamat mo. Thank you for coming. I think there's still coffee and food outside. Thank you, Dorian, again for sharing your time with us. And thanks to the family of Dorian for their support. Sochi, Mitzi, Ati Nancy at the back. Maraming salamat po. And have a nice day, everyone.